All right, hello everybody again. This is Randy Pick, the executive director here at RJI. And um, because Greg always has like three times as much stuff to try to cram into whatever time he's given, uh, we, we want to get going as soon as we can so we can, we can cover all the things on the table. Uh, so, where did I put my, uh, thank you, Matt. <laughs> All right, so uh, Greg Harper is president and founder of Harper Vision Associates and a nationally recognized technology expert. He frequently presents the latest in consumer tech at uh, industry conferences and on national television. He's visited uh, Mizzou several times and it's always refreshing to see his uh, energy and his enthusiasm. And uh, today, Greg is here to talk about uh, the list of up-and-coming technology trends that he calls his digital dozen. So, welcome, Greg. Thank you. <laughs> My mother always asked me, what do you really do? And uh, you know, she sees me playing with all, she says, you know, you're a kid that's never grown up. Uh, but actually, there's a serious part to this. Um, I, um, I actually believe that if you don't experience technology, you can't ex appreciate what it really is. And um, I solve business problems for large companies and small companies uh, with technology. But I try to think outside the box. And to do that, I really have to be aware of what the trends are. And I'm also co-founder of something called Gadget Off, which I'm going to show you a little video just to give you, put you in the mood for, for fun and stuff. Um, where we try to bring in creative minds. And I, just, I really enjoy coming to places like uh, Mizzou because I, I, the, the enthusiasm and the uh, ideas that the students bring uh, really encourage me. Um, I learn every day, and that's what makes my job fun. But I learn every day, and I actually then take this not just having gadgets. Um, most of this stuff, by the way, will end up in the Museum of Computing, or what I call my Museum of Computing, up in the Adirondacks. Uh, my wife made me uh, take uh, some of the stuff out of our house it took two 23-foot trucks uh, to get upstairs up in the barn, and the house is still full, and she's making noises. I should take another 23-foot truck up there. So I don't get rid of this stuff. So I actually use all this stuff, and I've been doing it for a very long time. But I just want to make sure you understand, while this is very interesting stuff, it is really just examples of what trends and things are going forward. And speaking of trends and going forward, one of the first things I thought I would do, just because it's lunchtime and we should have a little bit of fun occasionally, um, this is an event I, I put on called Gadget Off, and I thought maybe you might enjoy this. I love Gadget Off, it's like the ultimate geek fest. You know the day destroys the night. Night divides the day. Try to run, try to hide. Break on through to the other side. Break on through to the other side. Break on through to the other side, yeah. Gadget off. It's not just about gadgets, it's about innovation. If you go around here, I reach my limit of being able to press in some more new ideas. Uh, if you want to know what the future will look like, you have to invent it yourself. These are the people who are inventing it. So I normally stand up for an audience like this and give a really depressing talk about energy and climate change. But today, because it's gadget off, I'm going to just talk about something that I find beautiful and maybe useful. We just don't know how yet. What I care about is a future of very, very different transportation of self-driving cars. This is uh, extreme driving. It's called parking in New York. Get 
this guy out here. This guy is uh, less than one centimeter across. The hydrolophone is the world's first musical instrument that produces sound from vibrations in water itself. You guys can write on buildings with lasers, so maybe you can make this guy make graffiti again. The catch is he can only use his eyes. So this was the, um, the Homeland Security guy, and he showed that flashlight that um, makes you vomit. We reverse engineered how it works and basically made our own open source version. Yeah, and we have it here today. And it's all absolutely true. The Soviet Union really did build a doomsday machine that would have allowed them to retaliate against an American nuclear strike that knocked out the Kremlin and the defense ministries. Uh, over here on the side of the stage is the world's fastest high-speed video camera. This is about a quarter million dollar camera. There's about four of them in North America. And uh, we're able to shoot up to a million frames a second. So I can almost do it. That song, Who Are We? Uh, where do we come from? Where are we going? Where have we been? Answered in new ways that it hasn't been answered before through technology and, and improving human experience. Break on to the other side. Break on to the other side. Break on to the other side. That's Gadget Off, and uh, we do this. Um, uh, that event was at uh, Snug Harbor. We also do this for Google uh, every year, and I'm about to do it again in about two weeks. Um, which is a private event for the Google X. So they let me drive in the car. I get to show them my technology. And um, for those of you wondering, um, uh, yes, these are the Google glasses. And uh, I'm one of the explorers. And I'll be happy to show it to people afterwards. So the digital dozen. Um, what I did was i had been looking at technology and trying to understand what technology is uh, going to be changing our lives that is almost here. So things that are already here, like social media and other things like that, I don't put on the list anymore because we already know about it. I try to look at things that are emerging. And this list changes all the time. And in fact, some of the things are about to come off of it. But um, the, uh, the first one I want to talk about is app internet. Right now, I put a picture of someone's pack pocket here because the reality is that we now have moved from a world where we have to go to a specific place to get connected to where now the connection happens in everybody's pocket. And we think it's big over here. Wait till you see what's happening in the rest of the world. The next 4 billion people who are going to be connected to the internet are going to be connected via smartphones. They're not going to be connected by wires. They're not even going to have um, infrastructure that we even think of as today. When I was in Barcelona for the Mobile World Congress recently, I saw a cow. Now, not a moo cow, a cellular operation on wheels. It is a self-contained device. You see these at sporting events when you need to increase the cellular. It's basically a truck with an antenna coming up, and it adds extra cells to an area with a lot of people. But this cow was interesting because it was totally self-contained. It ran off batteries, solar cells, and a wind turbine. And it could be placed anywhere with microwave. And it was self-contained in a flight case environmentally. So you could literally build n number of these cows Pick any part of the world, Antarctica, the desert, anywhere you want, and just lay them down. Plop, 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 plop. You could probably deploy these things in a matter of hours. They all talk to each other, forming a mesh network, and instantaneously create a web of communications. And that, that is the way the rest of the world, the next four billion people, are going to get to the internet. And it's not just phones that are going to connect it, it's devices, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But just doing the internet, the notion of going to www dot whatever it is, to me, is a broken notion. And it's what I call app internet. If you think about it, when I came here, um, I had made a reservation online. So I went online to Delta Airlines. I had a car reservation through National. I had a hotel reservation through Hampton Inn. I had a lot of different things. But those, all of those were individual things. That's not the way it's going to be in the future. We're doing that because that's our legacy system here. But the rest of the world is not going that way. So when you have the internet or the connectivity in your pocket, things change. Like, for example, we're just starting to do it here with Uber. But all throughout Europe right now, you know, the idea of hailing a cab or not having a cab 
uh, instantaneously, it's like ridiculous. Of course you have it. You just go on your smartphone and you clail the hab. But that cab should know a lot more than just um, the fact that I want them. The app internet, which is going to be some form of combination, and Google's working on this, and other people are working on it, which will effectively say, oh, I know he's going to the airport for a four o'clock flight. And I know that that flight is leaving, and that I know the highway is kind of traffic. I better call the cab early and alert them to come. Or it's the flight is late, and I'll have it go later. So the cab, once I get in the cab, the next thing is when I get to the airport, the next one is when I get to the TSA. Well, right now, yes, I can have my boarding pass, but you know, why should I have to have a separate app to pull that out? Shouldn't that automatically pop up when I show up at the gate? Shouldn't it automatically be there along with my secure ID that, that connects through uh, some sort of a secure element like NFC to the, to the secure so they knows what it is as opposed to be handing them a piece of paper. I mean, how archaic is that? You know, a piece of paper that's got a, it's, it's like e-cash. I mean, like regular cash, that's pretty archaic as well. So, uh, and then when I get on the plane, why should I have to actually look up to a sign to find out what gate I'm going to? Especially if I'm wearing the glasses, it should pop up there and say, by the way, Greg, it's this way. And not only, it's th not only this is the gate, but there's a direction for it, and here's where to go. And when I get to on the plane, um, if I, yes, I know, it's a, it's a great picture. I thought, you know, reminding of what airline travel was like at one time. So when you, when you go there, unfortunately, that's not the way you travel today. When you go there, uh, you know, if you happen to like a particular type of champagne, they should know that and bring it to you. But more likely what's going to happen is you're going to have your menu beforehand. Instead of pulling out the little piece of paper, you should have, it should be pre-ordered, it should already be there. And they should already know all that information. I'm a very frequent Delta traveler. You know, that information should pop up. They should know about that when I get on the plane. And when I get to the other end, um, you know, instead of looking for the exit sign and where's the rental car and all the rest, it should automatically tell me where I'm going. It should automatically put that together. Now, all of this stuff exists. All of this stuff exists today. It's just not in one place. And of course, hotels. This is the one that gets me. Checking in at a hotel? I mean, how, how dumb is that? I mean, the hotel knows I'm coming. They've got my credit card. My phone knows I'm walking through the front door of the hotel. They know it's all in the computer system. Why should I check in? I should just walk in. I should say, welcome. By the way, you're in room you know, 403. Uh, go upstairs, and, and, and it's already electronic locks. It should automatically unlock the door for me and come in. And then I go in, and uh, the next thing is the TV. It's got some local television station on it I don't care about. It's got, I'm missing all my programs I have. Why shouldn't I have that all pre-programmed? By the way, um, you know, one of the major providers of, uh, of television in the hotel rooms, I just noticed today, uh, has declared bankruptcy uh, because people are not using the TV anymore. The old model was you come in your room, you turn on your TV. The new model is you bring in your iPad and you do data. So it's changing, all the rest. So app internet, and a room set up, it's not just the, the TV. It should be the right temperature, it should have the music I like, it should have the lighting I like. All of that is doable. Everything I've talked about is here today. It's just not organized. And it's going to be put together in a way that all this comes together. And somebody's going to put it together, whether it's a manufacturer or a, a phone company or uh, an entrepreneur, or um, it's going to be some sort of an appliance that you have. Uh, that's part of the idea behind um, the uh, Google Glass. So I am wearing Google Glass. Uh, I've had it for um, a couple weeks now. Uh, it's a very interesting concept. So what I'm seeing right now as I'm looking at you, I'm seeing a screen uh, that was about here in front of me, overlaid. I can transparent. I can see through it. And I'm seeing the time, which is 12.33. Uh, and I can give it a command, like I can say, OK, glass. And then I can say, take a picture. And so let me uh, uh, let's see if I can do this. OK, glass, take a picture. And I have now just taken a picture of you all. And I can show that to you later, and, that's, and I can post it to um, uh, Google, uh, whatever I want. Last night, I was walking to a restaurant here, and I was walking down the street. It started telling me about other places, uh, something about Campus Bar and Grill or something. It popped up on my screen. Um, and the same thing should happen when I walk through the airport and all the rest. This is the beginning of wearable technology. But this is not the, the whole the end of the wearable technology, because this is just one iteration. There are lots of other wearable technologies. So I happen to have more than the average person do. I'm wearing a Nike Fuel Band, uh, which gives me uh, activity. And I don't really know what this activity is, Nike Fuel Points. And I don't know what those fuel points really mean. But what I do know is that there's a number on here. And it's 857. I need to have a goal of 2,000. Uh, at 8.57, I better get moving because it's midday and I'm all not halfway there, so that encourages me to start <coughs> moving. 
Um, it's a combination of my age, my weight, my height, uh, and the activity I do. There are lots of sensors in here that creates the fuels. So if you wore the same glass, the same band with a different set of attributes, you would have, you'd get your numbers differently, which drives me nuts because my wife has been doing it and she regularly gets much higher numbers than I do, which is, uh, even though we walk exact same places. But anyway, I guess I have to do more exercise. Um, so Nike Fuel is one thing. Uh, this is another interesting one. This one actually I think is probably more interesting even than Google Glass. This is the um, Pebble Watch. Uh, this is the Kickstarter project uh, that started off with a $200,000 $200, goal. It hit the $200,000 goal within minutes of the, um, or in minutes, within hours of it launching. They went up to I think 10 million or something like that. Um, what this is is a watch that's um, using the e-ink technology you see in the Kindle. So it doesn't have a battery issue, so it'll run for a week on the battery. It's Bluetooth connected to my phone. In this case, I have to connect to an iPhone, but it can be connected to any phone I want. And if someone calls me, my, my wrist will vibrate. I will look down at my watch and it'll tell me um, who's calling. If there's an SMS message, I'll see the message. Uh, I can also use it to control my music. I can use it to see the time, of course. Um, and I can run apps on this. So, you know, when they tell you to turn off all your, all your electronic devices on the plane, it's kind of interesting for me. Do I turn off my, my armband? Do I turn off my watch? Do I turn off my glasses? Uh, on, on the other hand, I have the Sony watch. Um, this one is, um, this off shows time. This actually has a touch screen on it here, um, and I can run different applications on it here. Uh, it's connected to another phone, and uh, this is color. Uh, which is very nice conceptually, but it's a big problem because it's a color active display. It's actually an OLED display, but it uses up electricity. And so the watch has to be recharged uh, fairly regularly. So no recharging, recharging, color, no color. Hmm, you know, you have to think about it. I also have the Jawbone, um, which is another one of these activity lounge things. This one is interesting because it, what you can wear it at sleep and it will measure your sleep patterns. But the problem with it, and you can also take it in the shower, it's waterproof, et cetera. The problem is there's no display on it. So I don't really know anything until after the fact. I have to actually pair it with my, um, uh, with my phone at some point. But that's not all. There are lots of other devices, wearable devices. Um, yeah, this is an armband that actually has sensors in it that will actually measure your, your activity, your skin. Uh, this, is a, this is actually kind of cute. Um, this is for runners, and it, you see the little indicators on here? So this ties to your chest strap, and it's actually giving you a visual indication. So you tap this onto your glasses or goggles, whatever, and it just gives you LEDs telling you this one's just lying up red because I'm not doing anything. But if I were running, it'd give me green for goals, and et cetera. Uh, there are other watches. This is the Cuckoo watch. Uh, which is uh, like a cuckoo clock, it's not cuckoo isn't crazy. Um, this is a uh, check-in watch. I use this to check into Foursquare. So anywhere you go, just click in, it automatically sends a message, check into Foursquare. Uh, this is the Motorola version. Um, this version uh, ties into your heart rate, heart rate and everything else. And it also uh, adjusts your music. So if you're running, it'll automatically change your music and will change the program. And if you need to ha get faster, it'll, it'll, change, it'll change the music based on tempo, et cetera. So that's the concept. Um, and then there's the, there's the Fitbit, I, I just go on and on. But some of the more fun ones are um, the, um, uh, this. This is, this is uh, I'm not a golf player, but this is, I found very intriguing because this is a golf club. But it, what's interesting about it is it has um, sensors in the glove. And then there's a device here that connects to it, to the phone, and gives me uh, the grip on my golf club. You tie that in, and Nokia, with Windows 8, has an application which will actually look at where you are on the golf course, tell you what club to be using, and then it'll actually talk to the glove to figure out you know, how, what the grip is supposed to be and give you recommendations. So it's like having your own personal trainer in the golf world between a phone, location, and a glove. Um, and of course, we all have known about uh, the, the notion of, um, oh, by the way, this is uh, ski goggles. And I'm wearing uh, this ski goggle is the same idea as Google Glass. There is a heads-up display in here. Instead of being up, it's down. Uh, the ski goggles give you uh, information like your speed, your altitude, uh, the temperature outside, but also what they call friend radar. It tells you where all your friends are because it looks at uh, their GPS signals from coming from their phones. So you can see on the trail where everybody else is, so if you're losing anybody. And of course, this is a um, uh, com company, Recon, uh, ma married with Oakley. Again, heads-up displays, the military's been using these for years, uh, so they're just coming into the consumer world. These are available. This is not available. This will be out probably in a year. These you can buy at the corner store. And of course, you know, the, self, the, the, the Bluetooth headsets come in all flavors. Uh, this one I like because it just sticks in your ear. It's, there's nothing. And it automatically, it is saying, I plug it in, it automatically talks to me. It's NFC enabled. But probably my favorite uh, Bluetooth headset is this one. 
Um, this is um, a pair of gloves. And um, if you notice that occasionally it's flashing blue, because this is, in fact, a Bluetooth headset. I talk like this. Speaker is in here, <laughs> microphone's in here, and I, I go down the same. So I could be wearing my, my headset. I could be talking on here. Again, body-worn technology is the theme here, and there's going to be a lot more of it uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, I'm, I'm probably uh, the <laughs> bad example of all these things. But th this is happening. And uh, you know, we've heard rumors of the, uh, Google, the um, Apple Watch and all the rest. They're jumping on the bandwagon. Um, Apple is not necessarily a trendsetter in all cases. You know, we all think the iPhone was the, was the first uh, device that was out there that was a smartphone. It really wasn't. Nokia actually had the phone out a year before that had all the features of the iPhone. They did a nicer job of interface and a nicer job of putting it all together. But in fact, the idea of a smartphone was there uh, quite a bit before Apple came along. So I'm sure they'll take some of these ideas and the rumored uh, watch um, will probably build on these things, although it's going to be hard to, uh, to beat uh, the Pebble because it's a low cost and has a lot of great attributes on it. But we'll see what Apple comes out with if, in fact, that's going to be their next product. So don't be surprised if it comes out, but also don't realize, don't, don't think it's, by the way, some ingenious new idea. There's another one, by the way, that I have coming. I, it didn't show up in time, which actually uh, is a speakerphone watch. So it'll actually give you the time, but you can also talk to it and you know, Dick Tracy style. Um, so the, uh, the, next, the next of my digital dozen um, is the connected car. And this is another big area. If I'm the connected person, <laughs> the connected car is not far behind. In fact, it's so far not far behind that by the next, year mo next model year, every single Ford vehicle made in the United, sold in the United States will have uh, advanced telematics. And it used to be that you had to buy a fancy car. Uh, this is a model of my car. Uh, they gave me a model because I spent so much money on that crazy car. Um, the electronics on this thing cost a fortune. Uh, I can buy a whole car now with better telematics than this is uh, because of what they've done, which is bring your own device. Um, now this car, unlike the Google car, which I have ridden in, and it's actually quite an experience, uh, this car has uh, seven cameras on it uh, right now. This is, the, this is the car back in New York. I couldn't bring the car, obviously. It's got, a, it's got two cameras looking out in the sides, two cameras in the, in the mirrors looking down at the road so it sees the lines on the road. So if I go across the line, it will actually vibrate my steering wheel, tell me. It's got a FLIR camera in the front, which is an infrared camera for night vision, which automatically detects things in my, in my vision, and it'll pop it up on the heads-up display. So very similar to what I'm wearing here, there's a heads-up display on my windshield, which will tell me the, the, um, uh, the speed I'm going at. It will also tell me any, dire any directions I need for GPS. And if somebody, a pedestrian, comes in, it'll actually warn me. Then it'll do more than just warn me. It actually has active um, speed control, which is a fancy way of saying the car drives itself. Uh, basically, I have to steer, but once I get on the highway, I just set the maximum speed and the car will then do all the rest. It will accelerate, brake, stop, reaccelerate, slow down, keeping a safe distance from the car in front of me. And if somebody should cut me off or all the rest, it will, in fact, using its rear radar as well as the front radar, figure out how to put the car in in the, most safe, in the safest way. And if it comes into a situation where it detects that it might not be able to stop me, it will actually go into a safety mode. It will start recording all the attributes of the car on its onboard computer. It will start tensioning the seat belts. It will retract the, extract the steering wheel. It will send a message up to a BMW app saying there's a problem and um, will, of course, be footing off alerts and slamming on the brakes faster than I could as well. So, you know, it will try to protect you. This, by the, this technology, by the way, may become mandatory in Europe in not too long uh, a distance that we'll start seeing collision avoidance systems like this. Um, the Google car, of course, it takes one step further. Instead of just showing me, vibrating my steering wheel, it'll actually, it'll actually drive. That thing you saw on the top of the car, that's a LADAR, that's a laser detector uh, that spins. Uh, when you look at the points of light this thing sees, you can realize this thing sees far better than you can. The car actually doesn't drive by GPS, it drives by actually looking out the window and seeing what's happening, except in this case it's the thing on roof. Um, it's very, very impressive. But don't fret. You don't have to have a fancy car or a Google car if you want to have telematics in your car today. So if any of you have a car that was purchased or built in the United States since 19, uh, 1992, then you can add this little device. And this little device goes into the ODB port. I don't know how many of you know about the ODB port. It's by law, has to be put in every car sold in the United States. It has to be within, I think, 10 inches of your steering wheel to the left or the right of it, generally below. 
This is what the uh, inspectors do when they plug it in uh, to see whether your car's emissions are working properly. This is also a thing that when it says check engine light, you don't know what it is. The mechanic plugs his, pro his probe into it and the car tells him what's wrong with it. By the way, you probably want to get one of these just because the check en they'll pay for itself just by that one check engine light. Because you walk in and it says check engine light and the mechanic will say, oh, you need a new, it'll cost you a thousand dollars. Whereas this thing will tell you, and eh, now it's no problem. The reason the check engine light is on is because the gas cap isn't uh, properly sealed uh, or something similar to that. Or it will even go one step further. It'll actually tell you this is what's actually wrong with the car. And here is what other people have been uh, experiencing and how they get the repaired. And here's how to get it repaired. But this does one step further. This plugs in the ODB port, so it now knows all the things associated with the car, but it also has GPS capability and it has a mobile communications capability. And yes, uh, the cars are all going to be wired. My car has an, I an email address, so I can email address and messages to it. I can email uh, directions to it. You'll be able to do the same thing here. So of course, I can now locate my car. And if you saw on the Today Show uh, the interview with the um, gentleman who uh, was uh, carjacked in the Boston bombing, um, the way they were able to find him, he was driving a Mercedes that also has this capability, and so the car was telling the police exactly where it was. So they were actually a beacon of where it's going. This will do the same thing. This is what Progressive Insurance uses, a version of this. This is how they give you a lower price because it actually monitors your driving. And you can also set geofences with this. So if you have kids, you don't want them to go certain distances and all the rest, this will set a geofence, which means if they go beyond that area, it will send a message. Or if they drive erratically or too fast, it will send a message. It will also allow you to unlock. It's not very big, if you think about it. All it is is a connection to your car. All we're doing is taking what was a closed system just for the mechanics and opening it up. And then they're building apps on top of this thing. And then if you are uh, someone who likes to drive fast and you're not progressive insurance, and you get a radar detector. Um, this is a radar laser detector, which you all have seen, all the rest. And it's kind of cool and all the rest. But what's interesting about it is this little attachment that comes with it. So this plugs into uh, the side here. And this plugs into your cigarette lighter. And there's a button on here that says report. So this is now a GPS radar detector. So it knows where it is. It also is connected. And when you press this button, it will now send a message for where a cop might be or a street radar. And it essentially crowdsources the data of where speed traps are, et cetera. But it does more than that because it also knows where it's going and how fast it's going. And it will then send you traffic information. So now your smartphone and your car are all getting information. So a connected car, don't laugh, this is really happening. And you're not going to be able to buy a car without, this, without some form of this capability in the future. GM starting next year will start, when you buy a car, you'll also have to decide what cellular plan you want. You want a one year, two year, three year. There'll be all the cars will be uh, 4G LTE enabled. And there will be apps for those cars. So the car companies are going to build the human machine interface, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is the notion of how you interface the electronics, the steering wheel, et cetera. But um, the actual electronics will BYOD, bring your own device. You'll actually bring the devices you want, and there will be a phone. So as you can see, that's phone. You know, when Apple released the iPhone, if you recall, the program, the whole message was about hello. That was the whole campaign, hello, hello, hello. Um, but in fact, it's not being used for that anymore. It's being used for data. 63% of the use of the iPhone today, or in fact all smartphones, is for data. And that voice activity is going down and down. So this thing that I have in my pocket is not really a phone. It really is a computer. Connect it's actually a terminal connected to a computer. And whether the screen is here or here, or on my wrist doesn't really matter. Those are just interfaces. What really is all about, this is a very high power device. I was doing a, I was an event in Washington, which brings to my next uh, category, which is digital medicine, uh, for something called TED Med, which is the TED conference, but dealing with medicine. And um, I was standing next to the Apollo 11 spacecraft that had come back from the moon. And uh, well, I actually it orbited the moon, brought the astronauts back. And I'm thinking, my word, what I'm carrying, what I'm walking around here is not just 10 times, 100 times, it's a million times more powerful than what that thing that went to the moon is. And that's not that long ago. Uh, and that's the thing in the museum. So it's happening, and it's happening very, very fast. So medical. So I was at, as I said, uh, I was talking about um, the, um, uh, the TED Med. And TED Med is a, the te a TED conference, but its theme is on medicine. And I was fascinated and have been for a long time about the notion of medicine then how you can use this smarts to actually do something. So one of the problems with the medicine is you need to have input devices. You need sensors of some sort. And I was fascinated to see 
that there was something they had put together, and it turns out I had almost the exact same thing, um, which was a, a cell phone checkup. In other words, you could do a complete checkup. Everything you do at your doctor's office can be done by a cell phone. You say, well, why would you want to do that? Well, think about, again, these next four billion people who are connected to the internet. They're going to be in places, not only where those cows will operate, because remember, you can put them anywhere, and it automatically creates a network. And those people are going to have these devices, but the hospitals don't exist. You know, they're, not, they're not down the road. You're not measuring your time to the hospital in terms of minutes. You're measuring the time to the hospital in terms of hours, if not days. So having the ability to remotely diagnose somebody and do something is, in fact, a very interesting concept. So you've all seen these devices. This is a heart pressure, uh, a blood pressure monitor, plugs into your iPhone, and there are various versions for Android, et cetera. Um, this is a digital thermometer, same idea. You put it in, in the iPhone, you take a temperature, much more accurate, by the way, than anything else. Um, this is a sleep monitor. This will actually not just tell you how well you're sleeping, you actually put this on. It will actually measure your real sleep patterns, your REM sleep, your non-REM sleep, and actually give you a graph of what's going on. It's called Zio, connecting to your phone as well. Um, this is the oxygen pulse meter. So you, you, you put your finger in here, it automatically connects to the phone and automatically reads the oxygen level and my pulse. Um, this is a stethoscope. And although you can uh, use it like a regular stethoscope um, and get information, the real connection is this way because it's a digital stethoscope. And what it's doing is sending all the, all the, all the sounds actually amplified through the connector to whatever device you want to record. And that's not all. Um, this is an iPhone 4. It has a case with some little probes on the back. And if I, this is not available to the general public. Um, actually, some of this is not available either to the general public. But if I go into this thing here and I hold on to the back of this, you will see here, you'll start seeing a, tr a, a, a pulse. That's my EKG and it's now reading my EKG, recording it, and no different than what I'd have in the doctor's office. And that is now being sent to a doctor, and it's being remotely sent. Now, I can actually take this case off and just put it on my chest. I'm not gonna do it here. We're in polite company, but I mean, I can do the same thing, and I can just actually put it on here and actually read it. Yeah? Is that cardio Now, this one is called a live core, but it's the same idea. Uh, these, are, these, are, um, these are digital devices, input devices, um, we're also coming to an area of digital band-aids. Uh, this is a piece of flexible electronics. Uh, there's the chip. There's the NFC uh, uh, communication thing. These will be put into band-aids. They'll be putting on. These will be the sensors, so you won't actually have to hold something on. You'll have digital band-aids. And um, you're going to see that uh, showing up. This is a program that's starting with the digital health. Basically, it's a USB stick, but it's readable by any hospital with all the categories, so this would be all your information. U.S. militaries are already using this with chips. Uh, so you can actually, when someone's wounded in battle, you know, their blood type and everything else, this could have all your medical records. The amount of storage on this compared to those, all those folders in the, uh, in the hospital, it's there. But then, that's very nice for a doctor. And by the way, you know, all of this was, uh, I, did, I did a presentation at, at a TED Talk not too long ago, and I was talking about um, the impact of technology in science fiction. And I pointed out to uh, 1966 when Star Trek was first put on TV, and they had this thing called a tricorder, you know, and you run around and make a little funny noise and they diagnose you. Well, guess what? Today in uh, 2013, uh, there is a program out that's sponsored by Qualcomm. It's called the X Prize. It's called the Tricorder X Prize, and it's to divide, it's to build a machine that will weigh less than five pounds that can be operated by a civilian, not a doctor, that will diagnose 16 different diseases at the same accuracy as a panel of 100 specialists, and will continue monitoring it. And I'm told from people working on the project, they are very close to someone winning that project. So that's the same idea. So this is not so science fiction. And what's really interesting, and what I find interesting, is I start thinking about elder care, and I start thinking about people who are, uh, you know, we're, we're getting older, uh, we don't want to be in nursing homes or anything else. Even if we did, we probably wouldn't be able to get a room because of the baby boom, there are not enough beds out there. So, and we all know that your life expectancy and your quality of life is much better if you are in your own home, but yet how do you monitor? How do you know if the person that's getting Alzheimer's or lowering down, slowing down? So there are all kinds of things. I brought this as an example that I have a whole system for this, I couldn't bring it with me. This is just a simple sensor. But you put sensors like this, wireless sensors, you tie it with an activity thing where you stick this in someone's shoe, which will measure their activities. You don't have to actually, actually you know, put on one of these things. You have help, I want to get up uh, type things. You have pill bottles like this, which when you activate it, it lights up. Okay, what, this is a Wi-Fi connected pill bottle. So if someone didn't take the med, I know. 
and they would also be tied with other sensors on the refrigerator door and activity going out. And you can monitor, and it's, again, it's all about big data. Each individual piece of information doesn't mean very much. Put it all together and take it over time, and you can get a very, very accurate picture of what's happening to somebody, and you can know whether they need additional help or not. And then, of course, with those remote medical capabilities, you can actually diagnose it, et cetera, and with a tricarder. But I am only here, and I'm running out of time, so if I kept on going like this, we'll be here all day. So the next one is uh, near-field communication. And near-field communication, um, literally every phone that is, every modern phone that's made today, with the exception of one company, uh, this company, um, it starts with an A, uh, uses NFC for one way or the other. And we all know of NFC for a lot of different activities, uh, such as NFC for uh, eCash. Um, it started off in Asia. Uh, this is the PASMO card. It's used in Japan. Uh, it started off as a Sony project, um, and you use this uh, to ride the subways in Tokyo. The JR quickly picked up on it. Then the 7-Elevens picked up on it, and now it's spread. In fact, in, in, in Hong Kong, it's called Octopus, and that's because that's exactly what's happening. It's like an octopus arms around everything. But uh, what's really interesting is you, you, it's basically a stored value card. You put money into it as a secure element. But uh, you know, where, how do you put more money onto it? Well, instead of going to an ATM or something, you just have this little device that connects to your PlayStation. You can actually load the money uh, in your home. So you have your own ATM in, in your home. Uh, so those things. But NFC does a lot more than just electronic cash. This is a MasterCard, and it's a flexible card. But what's interesting about it is, and you probably can't see this here, but there's a display here. This is actually an active card. These are keys, and you can push buttons on here. This, of course, is NFC enabled. Of course, it has a magnetic stripe as well. But this is a new form of digital cash, so it adds, adds a secure element. So you actually have to put your PIN in here, and it can send messages to it, give you balances. You can use it for debit cards and things of that nature. So this is sort of the next generation of credit cards. And in fact, we probably won't be using credit cards at all. Um, but um, you know, you, the Europeans, of course, have got you know, the chips on their cards and magnetic stripes, and we're starting to get that in the States here. But all of this is still physical. It's actually all going to move to uh, completely virtual. If you go to Nigeria, 30-some uh, percent, 34 percent, I think, of the GDP, the GDP of the country is now transacted over mobile. Because again, there are no banks, there are no places to go, and um, it's, they're just using a, a currency. That currency happens to be called um, uh, uh, sell you in minutes, but it could be anything, bitcoins, whatever you want. Actually, I've heard that now PayPal is seriously considering adding bitcoins uh, to a payment system uh, so that you actually be able to pay use PayPal for bitcoins. But we're going to see more and more electronic cash. But NFC is more than just um, for payments. It also can be used for entertainment. So these are my uh, parrot headphones. And um, I uh, put them on, and they're very nice, high-quality headphones. Uh, they're wireless, they're Bluetooth, of course, but they're also NFC-enabled. So if I want to listen to music, all I have to do is tap my phone to this, and it'll automatically pair. Now, this is the part I never like to do live demos because it never works, but let's try. So this is a little NFC speaker, and it's off. And if I bring the phone next to it, it will automatically, hopefully, Oh, let's see. It started. I disconnected. So all I did was tap my phone to this. Okay, you saw I didn't push any buttons on here. So, of course, I got to turn it off. Uh, where's my music app here? Okay. So this, has, this little speaker has an NFC chip in it. So when I brought the phone next to this, it automatically said, ah, I am a speaker, you're a phone, you have music, why don't I make the two work? Now, that's just a phone example. But think about this now as you walk in your car and you tap it on your car and you lay it down. It will not only wirelessly charge, but also automatically link to your car. And that's for voice and data communications. But also, wait a minute, didn't I say this was a supercomputer? And what do you have? You have a Mac or something on your desk? That's not a supercomputer. This is. So why don't I have this work at my office in my home as well? So I just bring this in, I lay it down, uh, no wires, just lay it down on a charge mat, NFC. It'll automatically connect up to my screen. And so I have my keyboard and my screen, and I'm using this and I'm processing. These things have a lot of power. 
I saw, um, at, at, again at Mobile World, at a, a private demo from a new chip from Qualcomm. And this chip um, is doing four, it was, is an Octos chip, it's eight core chip. And this chip was able to do 4K video at 60p, which no consumer video player today can do. And then it was playing it on a large screen TV with 7.2 virtual sound, surround sound. And it was running off a mobile phone. Far more processing power. Now what's happening is, by integrating of the processor with the GPU, the graphic processing unit, is now giving these things far more power than a laptop. So these devices, it's just going to be pick your screen size, whether you want a personal screen, a small screen, a big screen, or a huge screen. And what's going to happen is you're going to use technology of NFC and wireless, wire, just going to come in and just dump it down. And in fact, you can even play with that today. Uh, Samsung has something called Tech Tiles, which you can buy if you have an NFC phone. Any, any of you have a non-Apple phone that's recent, you can play with these. Um, and you can basically put these tiles anywhere. You can put them on your business card, you can put it in your home. Uh, yeah, for an elderly person, you can actually put it next to a picture frame, tap the phone next to it, and make, make the phone call. You can program them yourselves. They're like 10 bucks for a pack of five. Um, so these are out there, and they're making a lot of money on that. So NFC is, is something that is, is happening. And NFC brings me to my next area, which is, um, uh, uh, which is called uh, Human and Machine Interface, HMI, Human and Machine Interface. We as technologists have done an absolute horrendous job of figuring out how to interface with electronics. When we talk to electronics now, we are doing it in a way that is menus and drop down menus and push buttons and selection and drag and here all the rest. I mean, it is the most arcane way of communicating with a machine uh, because we just use these other things. I mean, if I, I still use um, a pen and paper because I like to, I can organize my thoughts. So if I take a pen and paper and I, and I use a version of it um, like this, uh, I can still do it and I can still make it active. Um, and I just need to... Um, so if I, if I want to write something here, so I like, I like paper and pen, okay, and I can put notes on here. And if I'm doing a lecture, I'll say, you know, that's an interesting comment here. And then, good point. Now, I'm using a pen, but this pen is not any old pen, as you might imagine. This pen is connected to the internet. And it also will allow me to connect up here. And I hit a button on here. I like paper and pen. OK, and I can put notes on here. And if I'm doing a lecture, I'll say, you know, that's an interesting comment here. And then, good point. Now, I'm using a pen, but this pen is not any old pen, as you might imagine. So I can now, it's basically, there is a micro camera in here. This is dot paper. And what it's doing is it's, as I write in my scribble, I can't even read my own writing, but this, of course, can. It just goes to that location, and it figures that out. And of course, it'll all upload that to uh, Evernote or whatever you want. So now I have a, another version of human machine interface here, where I'm taking something known and thinking about it. Again, not 100% there, but people are starting to think about human machine interface. Haven't solved it yet, but it is a, it is a real issue. This is one of my favorites. This is a little thing that Black & Decker has, and this is for, this is a screwdriver, and I, I hold it, but what's interesting about it is if I turn it, it turns automatically by the pressure. The more I turn it, the more it screws, the more I let, the less it screws. It's just using accelerometers. So this is a very, very simple thing that is automatic human machine interface. This is a much more intelligent way than if you've used an electric drill, you know, forward, back, which way is it going. You just, you just, you just, just naturally, just turn it. Turn it this way, turn it that way. Down. And of course, the more you turn it, the harder torque it is. The less you turn it, the less torque there is. Of course, the, you saw and Dean came in a little video uh, with um, uh, Max, and he was using his robotic arm. Now, that was a couple of years ago when that picture was taken. And if you saw, Max was moving his leg, because what was happening is the, he put sensors on the foot. And so as he moved his hand, his foot, then that would move his arm. Max has no arms, by the way, at all. And so he was using the foot to do it. But they've taken it a lot further. This is the beginning of, of neural control. So you wear something like this. It actually measures your brain waves. Um, there are a number of these th things out here. There's the leap motion with 3D imaging. There are going to be a lot of new ways to talk to equipment and a lot of new ways to actually interface to it, whether it is a pen that listens to you, a screwdriver that has accelerometers in it. That's sort of the, uh, an area that I think is very, very interesting. We should pay attention. And of course, these things all interrelate. Just because wearable technology doesn't mean it does not tie into the medicine, does not tie into the NFC, does not tie into human machine interface. They're all somewhat related, but I'm trying to bring them into categories. Again, remember, these are just 
early examples of where this is going, and we're going to see a lot of innovation as we go forward. The, um, the next area is uh, over-the-top televideo. Um, having been a television producer for many, many years, that's something that I have been very interested in. Um, when I talk to people and they're selling smart TVs, I go, why would anybody want to buy a smart TV? I want a dumb TV. I want a bimbo TV. I want a big dumb TV. Uh, <laughs> seriously, because the smartness of the, of the TV are going to be obsolete in a matter of hours after you bring it home. What you really want is add little boxes. You know, this is the Roku, which does far more than any smart TV can do today. It's 59 bucks, 99 for the fancy version. Or you can buy a USB a HDMI stick to go in. Or even Kickstarter has little devices. You don't need that kind of device. In fact, you don't even need um, the, the cable. You can go, this plugs into a TV, a, a computer, and it automatically is a TV antenna. This does the same thing plugging into your iPhone. And this is all turning into an area which is uh, about to... <laughs> really disrupt the, um, um, the world of, um, of, uh, of uh, let me see, go over here, to uh, the, the, over, the world of, uh, please, window side, okay, well, we'll uh, so you'll get the idea. This is a Nimble TV, and what I want, the reason I want to show you this is, uh, it's, it's a little bit, this is not just the over-the-air TV, but as you go through here, you start seeing, these are channels that are now available over the internet, and so we can go to these various channels here, and as you can see, we've got PBS, but as we go down over here, you're going to get USA, you're going to get cable, Food Channel, HDTV, and yes, you will find A&E, ESPN uh, coming up here, Oxygen, We, Bravo, AMC, uh, BBC, FX, TNT, ESPN. All of this is now available on, um, on uh, uh, for TV, and you can just press the button here. Free and, uh, only at Carvel. Closed captioning on CBS2 News is brought to you by Cambridge Papers. And there is live TV. Drivers in danger as a driver in a stolen M rams, rams cars during a wild police chase. Now, the so this go. is live Most TV on my computer, but it also can play on my smartphone. It can also play on my tablet. But the best part about it is it will work anywhere. And so I, as I mentioned, travel a lot. And so when I am going to uh, Europe and I want to watch uh, the evening news in the States, I can do this. It's got DVR functionality. It's all there. That is, that is what's happening with the world of streaming. That is a subscription service, and you buy, you, it, it's a la carte. If I was a cable operator and I see this, I would be very, very worried. There's also area, which is even the same idea, which, I, again, I don't have enough time to get into all of it because there's still more to be done here, but uh, I'd be happy to talk to anybody about it later. This is a scary area if you're in the broadcast business. If you own a stick, i.e. in a t TV transmitter today, ugh, <laughs> that's an interesting problem. And it's interesting because there are also devices like this. This is a little red box with a uh, EVDO modem, uh, not EVDO, uh, LTE modem on it. This is a full live streamer. Now you've seen uh, the trucks, and if you've you know, worked in television, you know that we've all used the satellite trucks and all the rest. This thing will actually broadcast uh, full motion video. It'll take HDMI in. There's a version of HDSDI. It's battery operated. I can literally stick this on top of my camera and be live broadcasting with it. So this live streaming and broadcasting is something that is, is actually happening. And which actually brings up the next, which I'll go to in a second, the next thing, which is image capture and cameras everywhere. And so when I do cameras everywhere, I mean cameras everywhere. When CMOS first came out, and I was actually in an event not too long ago with the inventor of the CMOS chip, and he had a hard time convincing people that CMOS made a sense. It was all CCDs or other types of things, expensive cameras. We're now at the point where they're making 50 CMOS cameras a second. They're going to all your cell phones, et cetera. There are lots and lots of cameras. And those cameras are being used for all kinds of things. It's not just, um, it's not just the, um, the issue of, um, let me see here. If I go here, that is a live shot uh, from our house in Ireland overlooking uh, Galway Bay. And it's about sunset, which is about right. And so it looks like a nice day, not too crowded, not too much rain. This is, this is, you're having cameras. But I can now, up here, I mean, I'm sitting here in Missouri, and I, not only can I look at Galway Bay and all the rest, but if I hit this little button here, I can actually start looking around and see what's happening in my property. <laughs> I can look around and see, oh yeah, light's coming in. Uh, yeah, there's no problem here. And I can zoom in tremendously here with this camera, so I can zoom in to see whether uh, oh, look, there's a light bulb here that needs to be, it needs a shade. Uh, 
um, so I am, I am zooming in on that light bulb here. And as you can see, I can get pretty close. So digital cameras are now, um, and I'm still not done yet, I just found the end of it. And uh, you, just, you can see now the quality of the capabilities of cameras. That's not a digital zoom, that's actually an optical zoom. So this is, I, I mean, thinking about this a few years ago, this would have been impossible. This is streaming video, this is CMOS cameras, this is robotics and remote control all happening. You're looking at a light bulb in Ireland, live right now, uh, at a very, very close location. Okay, I could pick something else, uh, but I decided not to do that. Uh, obviously, I've got multiple of these cameras all different places, and I won't run some of the ones at home because my wife is there, and I don't think I want to start showing those things. But um, I will show you this. This is a little Samsung camera, same idea. But this is interesting because this camera can operate using a battery and just be placed, just Velcro it anywhere. And it has enough smarts in it that it will know whether there's a picture, uh, something different happening, it will actually send you an alert. So in Ireland, for example, not this camera, but another one, I got an alert the other day and it said, you know, something's happening. So I hit my, on my phone and I heard, it was late, it was af afternoon, I heard this rattling sound, bum, 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 bum. Like, oh my God, what's that? It sounded like someone was dragging somebody down the stairs. And I, I looked around, didn't see anything wrong, so I decided I better call the, uh, the caretaker to see if there's anything happening. And I called up, so this little guy in Ireland, and I said, you know, is there something happening at Dunagore? And he goes, how did you know? And I went, what, what, what? <laughs> he said, we're having the worst hailstorm ever. And what I was hearing was hail hitting the window. But the system was listening to audio and optical coming back and sending me an alert on my phone. So that's video everywhere. But video everywhere is not just video of that nature. I moved that camera around by physically moving it. This is a new camera called Panacast. Now this camera, and I, I, I tried to hook it up here, but unfortunately it, it's a little more difficult to do in a demo here. But if you notice, there are lots of lenses, okay? This hammers lots of lenses. So what this does is it takes all these pictures, seams them together as one signal sig s s image, sends it to a server, which means that any number of people can then, uh, that I allow, can go look at this camera, and they can then look at any part. They can actually move it around and zoom. So where I move that camera physically, you could actually do that remotely. So on that camera, when I moved that camera in Ireland, it physically moved. Okay, this camera doesn't move, it locks in, and now you can get any shot you want. They're actually now using this for sporting events where they're actually using higher resolution cameras, so they're able to get uh, very high resolution and they're able to zoom in on it. That technology is called ultra high definition television, which is another big thing happening. And this is an example of ultra high definition camera, uh, ultra high definition TV. Two year, three years ago, I built an ultra-high-definition telepresence system. Ca cameras cost me a bloody fortune, um, and I had to bring them in from Japan under special export control because they were afraid they were going to go to a satellite. Now you can go to your favorite store and you can buy this. This is a 4K camera. This actually shoots 4K. Now, it does have some limitations. The biggest one is you don't have one HDMI, but you have four because it's much thing, and you can't record on one uh, SD card uh, too much data. There are four SD cards, but this shoots true 4K. And 4K is now happening and is available on TV. In fact, even this GoPro is, this little GoPro will shoot 4K. Not at, not at, not at 60 frames or 30 frames, but it will shoot 4K. And this GoPro, and as you probably know the story of GoPro, this is a, an example of a camera company that started from nowhere and is doing wonderful things. But uh, the other thing that's happening in digital photography is this. This is called the Lytro. And the Lytro is a different concept of photography. It's using light field. All these other cameras basically have a sensor that gets images and you read them, you scan it. But this actually sends all the vectors of the light. And if you're scanning all the vectors of the light, you can do some pretty cool things. And let me show you what I mean by pretty cool things. Um, so if I go over here to Lytro, you will see there is a picture. Um, and if I were to focus here on that tree, I can put the tree in focus, but notice the sign went out of focus. I could also put on the sign, focus on the sign, and the sign is now in focus. I can change the focus of the camera, of the picture after I shot it. And not only can I do that, I can also change the parameters. I can actually change the relationship of these designs. I can move things around because this is an early prototype, but this is the idea of light field. It's bringing lots of rays coming in. And I just attended another lecture on laser uh, imagery and laser photography um, along with, and by the way, that's the same concept that was in that uh, high-speed camera you saw earlier on. 
But when you start putting lasers in it and laser images, all of a sudden, all, everything you knew about lumens and the way you look at light on the thing, totally different. You know, I got thinking radians and all the rest. A lot of advances coming in photography, not just remote cameras or digital cameras, but actually totally new ways of looking at things. Um, of course, there are fun ways as well. Uh, this, of course, does have a camera. As you know, I can say, take a picture, I can do video, I can do video chats with this. Uh, this is an, these are a pair of sunglasses. Uh, these uh, record HD uh, 1080p in stereo, and they're very, very nice and make really wonderful pictures. Um, the next thing, I should probably go back to my, my little slideshow here. How much time do I have? Not much more time, so we're going to go a little faster here. Um, so if I go back to PowerPoint here, yep. Okay, so we did uh, digital imaging, over-the-top TV, we did digital imaging. So the next one is robotics. Uh, this happens to be a personal favorite of mine. Robotics are changing things in lots of different ways. So the simplest one, first robotic example is this. I thought this was kind of cute, another one of these Kickstarter projects. It's basically a robot to run your smartphone and use it for video. So you can actually, you put your phone in here, uh, you normally put a little piece of tape on it so it doesn't fall off. This device then, you can then control with this little controller on the back via your phone, and you can drive this around. So if you've got someone at home, you can drive this little thing around. You can you know, want to change the angle, what do you want to see? So you're actually giving, it's a remote control camera, very inexpensive. So similar to that system I had before, but unlike my camera, which I can't take off its shelf, this thing can drive around. Uh, so this is kind of fun for robotics. Um, of course, I also love 3D printing. Um, I have a 3D printer, again, too big to bring, uh, fascinating areas, but we're not just printing little plastic pieces of things. This is an iPhone case, by the way, all moved and all 3D printed. But you can start thinking about what you can print with this stuff, and some of the stuff you can print is truly amazing. You can print buildings now. You can print electronics. You can print medical. You can print skin. You can print bone. Uh, all kinds of things. I mean, printing the skin, that blew me away. I mean, literally, they take cells from your skin, if you're a burn patient, they culture them, they put them into tanks that look like inkjet tanks, and the thing goes and it prints out skin. Um, so, and so here's something going on. Someone's trying to call me, uh, but I will not answer the phone. <laughs> that, again, the advantage of this, uh, my, my, my wrist is vibrating. Um, robotics also are, don't have to necessarily be uh, physical devices uh, that, that, are, that are actually moving things. This is uh, something that I find fascinating. This is a device. Um, which is a quadcopter. And as you can see, it, uh, it lights up and does all kinds of fun things. And uh, I know you have a robotics program here uh, for things. Uh, this is something that uh, I found fascinating because of its price point and its capabilities. So this little device, um, so this is my quadcopter here. It's got a GoPro camera on it, and it costs uh, about uh, $600, basically. Um, and it comes with a real controller, and I'm not going to fly it in here because it's going to be too dangerous to do. But this device, and we've seen a lot of these quadcopters and doing things, but this one has a few extra capabilities for that same $600, not, not including the camera. The first is, of course, it has accelerometers, so it knows its angles and it, and, and it knows it's where it's going and, and angles and everything else. It also has a barometric altimeter. It's the same thing they use in airplanes, so it knows exactly how high it is. Of course, it has a, a compass, so it knows in which direction it's playing, a magnetic compass, and it's GPS enabled. And not only that, it has a very sophisticated computer and algorithm on it. If you ever try to fly one of these things, one of the things you'll learn out, especially if it's far away, is you don't know whether you're, what's forward or back. You don't know whether you're looking forward or backwards. And so therefore, your controls, you know, if this may, this may be go forward, but if you're looking at the back, it'll actually go the other opposite way. This is smart enough now that it will actually figure out its angle and change the controls on here so they respond according to your logic. That's human-machine interface. So if I go this, it will always go forward, no matter the orientation of the, device, of the, of the aircraft. And, and because it has GPS and all the other capabilities, it will, it will sit there and find its position. I'm getting very shortly a, a mount for the camera, which will actually give it uh, gyroscopic controls. So it will be very stable. And if, you, if a wind goes, it'll just move right back. So you can go right to position and stay there on GPS. And you can set the GPS positions. So you can go from here to here to here to here, and it'll do it, so it'll conduct a move. All this for $600. And it is, it is quite a sophisticated little piece of equipment. So that's what's happening in robotics. Um, next up, and I've got not very many more minutes, 
is um, cloud computing. Well, that's probably, this is probably the one that's going to go away in terms of my digital dozen because it's become ubiquitous. Uh, and I, I was looking for examples of cloud computing. Probably the best example of cloud computing, though, is this. This is the uh, Facebook phone. Uh, not really the Facebook phone. This is an Android phone with a Facebook interface on it. This is actually sold by HTC. What's interesting about it is its screen is, in fact, your Facebook screen. And this is talking about, this actually is using all the processing of the cloud of all these images. So instead of having a screen that is based on, on, um, on, uh, on your, uh, uh, based on, you know, what the computer, this is the home screen for the phone. And this is a concept of actually tying uh, big data into a way that you can actually analyze it and look at it. So it looks at feeds, it looks at its location, et cetera. Uh, same thing, this is a device, if you're we're in, into journalism, this is a device that allows you to broadcast uh, from anywhere because this is a two-way satellite GPS. And I almost forgot because we were talking about cameras. If you call, some of you may have been here last year when I was talking about some things, and I showed a briefcase with a complete uh, studio. Well, a year later, guess what? It's a product. This is a product from Sony. This is actually as it comes from Sony. And if you were to open this up, so you, you buy this at the store, and what you'll find in here is a complete broadcast capability in your backpack. So instead of Greg putting it together as sort of a one-off, this is now a product, a SKU, that you can buy. So what you find in here is a broadcast quality camera with microphone, wireless mic, uh, proper lensing, battery, an interview mic to interview somebody else with. It comes with a streaming, live streaming capability, so you can actually broadcast this live. It comes with a lavalier microphone, so you can do your reporting on it. So this is a product. I mean, this is, instead of building, your, I'm sure you've built kits like this here for your people. This is now not a, you know, not do it yourself. This comes as a complete kit, and it comes with everything. It comes with the cables. It comes with even lens cleaner. I mean, it is, it is the whole nine yards. So they have realized that this is the new way of journalism. And you plug this into a live streamer, and now you're now broadcasting live. So what was a demo last year is now a product today. Um, so you guys may want to actually look at these type of things. Because um, this is actually, th this would be, uh, it's NX Cam. It's uh, high quality video. This would be accepted by a broadcaster. And it comes with a tripod and everything else along with it. I'm not going to pull that all apart. So um, if you're in the journalist space, you have the capability of broadcasting from anywhere uh, through um, a box like this, and it's a backpack, and you're not uh, you're not dealing with um, with technology that you have to put together. Okay, two more, and then we are going to end quickly. Um, Internet of Things is my next one, and the Internet of Things is uh, I'm sorry, Internet of Things. Everything is getting connected. If you haven't found that theme on here, it's really coming through. So we have the digital thermostat. This automatically knows the temperature. It looks at activity in your house. It automatically adjusts the temperature whether you're there or not there. It has geofencing, so if you're away from the house and you're not there, it will actually drop your temperature to a more economical level. If you get close to the house, it will bring it back. It knows how long it takes for the house to get from its present temperature to another temperature, so it can either go up or down automatically. All that presence here takes about a, m a week to learn once it does it. This is a digital plant sensor. You plug this into your, into your plants, and this thing will actually me send you messaging about what plants you need, what, what they water they need, what, what nutrients they need. Uh, this is an uh, air quality sensor, not just temperature, but it also does CO2. It also ties it in with what's on the internet and comes back and gives you information. This is a water sensor, which goes in, again, wirelessly communicating this water in your basement or something else brings it together. Uh, this is just a plain old motion sensor. Uh, this device here is kind of fun. Back to the tricorder, if you remember the Star Trek, it also did environmental things. Um, well, this device has different nodes on the end. It's called the node. It has different tips on it, and there are more tips in here, uh, which do everything from gas to color. Uh, this particular one on here is for any of you who have ever tried to match paint samples. This thing is very helpful. You, know, you look at those little chips, you can't tell you what the paint is. Well, this has a calibrated light. You stick it on there, it measures one, then you look at the other one, it'll tell you the difference between the two, and it'll give you actually panatone capabilities. This is environmental and temperature. Um, this um, is a, uh, a digital lock. Uh, so there's no, there's no, you know, back and forth, but I can go in here and uh, I think there, and I can unlock it if I know the right combination. There are umpteen zillion combinations. There's nothing to do. I've got the same thing for my front door 
and it'll actually run NFC. <laughs> this one's out of Russia. Anyone want to guess what this one is? It's a radiation sensor. And this actually ties to your iPhone, gives you radiation. So we're seeing the Internet of Things. But where everything is getting IP address, and what I really like, though, is this is a light bulb, and I'm, it's in a, basically a light socket, and there's nothing a light socket in here. And if I go in here and I hit this button and I say, I would like it to be on, I would like it to be, by the way, yellow, I can turn this on and make it yellow. But if I also want a different color, I can change the color of this, and I can say, give me a different color, um, a light bulb. So the bulb does not need a switch, it does not need a dimmer, it is not only an on-off light bulb, I can turn on and dim it and everything else, but I can actually go and change the colors on this. And then with the camera on here, I can actually take a picture of somebody's color and I can say, oh, I want to get Roger's uh, blue shirt and I want the bulb to be the same color, the same way. And of course, I can tie multiple bulbs together. This is the Internet of Things. That's why we need the new IP addresses, because we're running out of IP addresses when we start adding IP addresses to light bulbs, et cetera. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, oh, by the way, it's LED, of course, and so it uses very little thing. So the final one is, um, and, and again, I've talked far too much. The final one is education and uh, digital education. We all know about Coursera and other things like that. That's your business, so I, I don't want to get into that. But you've also talked about Raspberry Pi, and I was very excited to hear so many people in the program here using the Raspberry Pi. I mean, this is a very interesting concept here, the Raspberry Pi. It's bringing, it's allowing people to build and work on projects because they have the hardware. But one of the problems is how do we get that information in the hands of the kids early on? And this is where I find something called little bits, which I find to be su super interesting because we're beginning to get people. We can Raspberry Pi will do the software, but what little bits does is it comes together with a very simple concept. You've got blue things, pink things, orange things, and green things. So blue things are power. So I have a battery and power. That's a blue thing. The pink things are input. And so um, let's put a input device on here. They're magnetic, so uh, I have a slider on here. And then uh, I'm going to add an output device. Uh, so let's put in a, a light here. And now if I turn this on and I bring this up here, I can now adjust it. So I'm now learning about power, control, and uh, output. Okay, so it's basic for kids. But now, and it's all magnetic, so you can't get it wrong. Now, if I want to add something different to that, let's say I don't want that connection. What I really want is it to be uh, based on light. So I can take, um, this is uh, pulse. I don't want to put pulse. I want to do light. Uh, where is light in here? All different, all different ones. I think this one may be light. Yes, light. I think this is light. So if I put that on there, and I will, and the output, let's make a buzzer on here. So there's a buzzer, and if I take a flashlight, I can, okay? This is a way of doing Legos and other people. It allows people to know how to actually build things. And of course, this input does not have to be a battery. This can talk to the Raspberry Pi. So now you can actually learn how mechanical things work. You can then plug this into the USB of the Raspberry Pi. I believe that if you don't know how to program today if you're a young person, it's the same thing as not knowing how to read and write in today's society. So that's why I think that education is not more than just Coursera. It's about getting people exposed to this early on where they can put things together in a safe way. Anyway, I've talked far too much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> I would say, are there any questions? But I know everybody's hands will go up, so. <laughs>